Good evening. Starting a few minutes late today, um, as I'm trying to uh, uh, get some things fixed on this uh, um, Facebook feed. Um, it's maybe been some kind of um, an update, so I'll have to figure out what's going on. Um, so I'm posting it portrait today, um, and we'll just have to work our way. Sorry, Mike, you'll probably have to change it around. So anyway, uh, tonight we're going to, tonight and tomorrow, we'll look at uh, the Ascension Day text, which is Ascension Day is tomorrow, 40 days after Easter. And we're going to look at the gospel lesson tonight and tomorrow the first lesson. The gospel lesson uh, is the end of Luke and the, the first lesson is the beginning of Acts, that two-volume work that, uh, that um, uh, Luke wrote. And so we're going to see some commonalities between the two. But that's what we're doing tonight. So greetings, the Lord is with you. And uh, we together make the sign of the cross as we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, uh, thanks to everybody watching, Shirley and Priscilla and Debbie and uh, all those others who are on. Uh, greetings. And uh, why don't we start with a word of prayer? We're going to be looking at Luke 24, 44 to 53, if you want to uh, uh, click on in a little bit. Uh, hi, Mary Beth. We're going to start with a word of prayer, everyone. Lord, thank you for our, our time together this evening. Just a pause and a break after dinner, hopefully, and uh, I'm sure some things to get back to for all of us. But thank you for this time in your word. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of the ascension um, and what you're doing when you, when you go to, uh, into heaven, what you promise as you're leaving and what you uh, commission us uh, to do. Uh, Lord, open our ears and hearts Open our lives to your word and to the message you wish to share tonight and tomorrow. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've been saying that we're going to, on, on Sunday, be looking at the gospel lesson from John 17 for 7 Easter, the high priestly prayer. But I thought tonight and tomorrow night, we would look at two of the texts assigned for Ascension Day, which is tomorrow, the 40th day after Easter. And uh, I see uh, Kathy's on as well. Uh, hi, Kathy. Good to see you tonight. Um, Luke 24. Let's start reading. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. Here's our gospel reading. Wow. Well, we have um, the end of the Gospel of Luke. And there, uh, Jesus says what, again, what he had done to the two on the road to Emmaus and to the, to the disciples uh, later that evening. Um, Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Um, and he said to them, everything written about me in the law of Moses and prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. There is so much in the Old Testament uh, of prophecies regarding uh, the first coming of the Messiah and many more regarding the second coming of the Messiah. And so we are, um, um, Jesus, is, and not only about his comings, but about his nature, his character, 
uh, the, um, uh, the, the nature of his kingdom that he's going to establish. And, and Jesus says throughout the Old Testament, the five books of Moses, uh, the prophets, which is um, almost all the other writings, the Psalms uh, and the, the, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, um, are a certain writing book of Job, sometimes called the writings. But the books, what we call the books of history, First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Chronicles, and all the prophets are together known as the prophets because God is speaking in history. History is his story. And, and so um, it's the story of God's word and working with his people. So um, Jesus, again, I, I love this picture, opens their mind. Um, you know what that's like. You just don't understand something and not, uh, aha, I, I finally get it. Uh, it's like a door is opened. Um, uh, Martin Luther spoke about that um, the Wesley brothers spoke about that, that, that as they came to a, a new understanding of the gospel, it's like a door opened. And they began to read the whole Bible differently. Certainly that was true for Martin Luther. He was plagued by the law, uh, all the demands of God. And, and he knew honestly that he was not, he didn't keep those demands. And so he was always living in fear of God. And then the door of the gospel opened. What the law could not do, Christ did in the flesh, on the cross, paying the penalty demanded by the law and bringing absolute 100% forgiveness of all our sins. He made us new. He clothed us with righteousness. He, he brought us into God's family. And, and as Luther became aware of that, it made his reading of the whole Bible different when he understood the gospel, when we get to know Jesus and we understand the gospel and the law appropriately, rightly. And Lutherans are pretty good at teaching this. Then the Bible becomes not a fearful book, but a book of promise and hope. So, he opens their mind to understand the scriptures. And he begins to say in specific ways what the Old Testament was talking about. Thus it is written, the Christ should suffer. And on the third day rise again. Remember, he, he told the disciples numerous times he was going to go to Jerusalem and suffer and be killed and on the third day rise again. Well, again, he's reiterating this is the Old Testament, and he opens their mind to understand, and they begin to th see and think of the passages in the Old Testament that, that prophesy to this. Um, and, and we could go in more depth. There, there's no specific prophecy about the third day rising from the dead, but, but Jesus pointed out that the story of Noah, excuse me, the story of, of uh, Jonah in the belly of the whale, three days. He said, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days, so must the Son of Man uh, rise from the dead after the third day. And, and, and he brings salvation to all people, just as Jonah, after the third day, went to Nineveh and brought salvation, uh, not wanting to, but, but prophesied. And the people of Nineveh, the enemies of God, repented, and God spared them. So Jesus has come to God so loved the world that he sent his, God so loved the world that he sent his son uh, to redeem the world, to save the world, that whoever believes in him should not perish. So, so he's going to rise on the third day and, and Jesus has already said that story in Jonah was talking about me. Um, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in my name to all nations, to the Gentile Roman soldier centurion at the foot of the cross, to Cornelius the centurion, to the, to the uh, Ethiopian eunuch on the way back home to Ethiopia uh, and, and around the world that, that his word of forgiveness, repentance and forgiveness is not just for Jews, it's for me too, for everyone. It is that, that this word of the Old Testament is clear that God comes to save the world. God said to Abraham, 
uh, through you and your seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Not just Jews, not just his seed, but through his seed, through Jesus, all the nations will be blessed. So as we look at the Old Testament and we, we find how it applies to Jesus, we're just doing exactly what Jesus did when he opened the door. Uh, he just lets us in. He gives us a new way of reading the Bible through the lens of, of Jesus Christ and the gospel message. Well, um, then it, so, so as he repeats these things that he said ahead of time, now he says them afterwards, and that repentance and forgiveness proclaim to all nations in his name. And then he says, you are witnesses of these things. Uh, it's important that there were people who saw him dead, who buried him. Jesus, uh, the, some of the disciples, but, but some of those standing by and the women and the soldiers saw that he had died, thrust a spear into his side, and the blood and water came out. All these are witnesses to the death and then the disciples to the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, this is not an idle tale and Almost all the disciples, except for John, went on to uh, martyrdom. And I've said this before. People will die for things they sincerely believe in. People will die for their country. People will die for their family members. But no one dies for something. No one's willing to die, gives up his life freely for something he absolutely knows to be a lie. And yet all the disciples are willing to give up their life rather than deny the truth. Some people will die rather than tell the truth, but nobody dies willingly for something they know to be a lie. But the disciples, and, and the disciples willingly die for what they know to be true. They were witnesses of these things. And then Jesus says, behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. <coughs> well, he's been talking about the Holy Spirit. He does a lot of that in John's Gospel uh, during the Last Supper. And Mark, does, uh, Luke doesn't record that in, in his Gospel. John does. But he has promised to baptize with the Holy Spirit. And, and from the very first days, John the Baptist says, I baptize with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So, so as Jesus comes from his baptism, John points to him and says, this, this is the one who isn't going to just wash you on the outside. He is going to invigorate you Infire you with his Holy Spirit uh, from the inside out. So Jesus said, now's the time. He'd been filled with the Spirit in his baptism, but now it's going to be the time for the disciples to be filled with the Spirit, and then everyone who believes baptized and filled with the Spirit. Behold, I am sending the promise of my Father. This is the, the promise of, excuse me, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Stay in the city. Don't do anything except wait. And waiting in the scriptures is always staying connected to God. And we're going to see in the text tomorrow from Acts 1, uh, as the story continues, uh, what the disciples did when they were staying uh, in the city. But he said, stay there. Um, don't get busy doing anything. I've commissioned you to go proclaim uh, baptism and forgiveness and 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 repentance uh, and faith. I, I've been and the story of my death and resurrection. I've commissioned you to go out in the world and do that, but don't do it yet. Wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. We can have lots of good ideas, but it's worth pre waiting and praying and asking God what His will is, and to let His Holy Spirit lead us. Stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Today we had our staff devotions. We usually meet on Tuesday, but we had a need to change our devotions, uh, well, our, our staff meeting to today, and we always have devotions as part of it. Um, and uh, we, 
focused in the devotion conversation on two words in that uh, last sentence. Stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Stay. Just wait and so how hard it is to do that. But we pray and we trust. Uh, we wait. We don't get anxious about God not quite doing it on our timetable. And then we get ahead of God and get into trouble. But we wait. It's kind of like a dog that doesn't know how to heal. He's crossing in front of people, getting in their feet. and No, just, just stay. Um, wait for God to move and then move in step with him. Uh, what we teach our dogs is really good for them. And, and it's good for us. Uh, my, uh, uh, our in-laws, uh, uh, Bob and, and, and uh, uh, my mind just went blank, uh, Paula, golly, um, uh, have a new little puppy. <laughs> and sometimes he gets underfoot and they decide they were going to take him to obedience class so he would learn to stay and then be able to assist with some tasks if, if needed. Um, great idea. A dog, we had a dog one time, her name was Buffy. She would never walk with us. Uh, would you let her out of a car somewhere and she would just take off running and then you'd wait forever for her to come back. She was absolutely undisciplined and it was a horror to take her anywhere. So dad took her to a trainer for I think two weeks. He loved that dog. Giving that dog up for two weeks was really tough. And then the trainer after a week brought dad in to begin working with the dog and it might have even been three weeks. It was a long time. But when Buffy came back Buffy healed. When you, you stopped, she'd sit. And when you, you let her out of the car, she'd wait for you to give permission to run. And when you called, she'd come right back. Guess what? We took her out all the time. That dog had so much more fun because she lived within the boundaries of obedience. Jesus said, stay. Don't do anything. Stay. Wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. Stay. And, and trust him, be patient, be obedient. Stay in the city until you are clothed with power on high. And one of the staff members said that that word clothed just jumped out. And it's not a word that we get dressed. It's to be clothed. And of course, God clothes us. Who gets clothed? Well, uh, sometimes a bride is assisted in getting dressed up on her special day. Um, I, I thought at uh, graduation, someone with their master's or doctorate gets, gets a sash placed over their shoulder or a new gown put on with special symbols on the sleeves and, and, and draping down the neck to signify the degree uh, that that person has earned. Uh, they are, it, it's like an investiture um, uh, that that robe, that crown, uh, that it is placed on them. The um, uh, a baby is clothed because they can't do it themselves, and so they are kept warm, they are cared for, they're protected. Um, we are also we can think about being clothed. A, a scuba diver uh, putting on the big heavy helmet and he can't go down on his own. Uh, one of the deep sea divers or. Uh, uh, a soldier that might be might be uh, getting his, being given his his uh, uh, protective gear, uh, um, a police officer putting on his bulletproof vest. We are clothed. We are protected. Wonderful phrase. God clothes us in the new in the Bible. When we talk about being clothed, we especially talk about being clothed with with Christ. Um, throughout the New Testament. We could take time to look at it, and we won't have that time tonight. But you could do a word search. Uh, uh, and we are clothed in Christ's righteousness. Our old filthy garments are taken off, just like dirty laundry after working out in a muddy field. And he puts his new clothes on us. He washes us. He cleans us. And, and he takes away our sin and gives us the clothing of righteousness, a, a right relationship with him, a relationship at peace with him. Um, th there's so much about this word clothing. And, and the point is, he clothes us. We don't clothe, our, clothe ourselves. We cannot do it. 
Uh, he is holy. We can't become holy by anything we do, but he gives us his holiness. <laughs> what a wonderful thought. He clothes us with his garments. I, I think of the story of the prodigal son uh, and the father waiting for him and putting the new robe on him, signifying that this is my son. Um, he clothes us. You are his daughter. You are his son. And in baptism, you are clothed in Christ, covered with Christ. Uh, people look at you, and it's, it's kind of like a, a Halloween outfit. They see Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, uh, wait until you are clothed, just covered, with power from on high, with the anointed and covered with the Holy Spirit. And then he led them out as far as Bethany. That was through Jerusalem, down the Kidron Valley, and up the uh, Mount of Olives to the top of the hill and just over the hill to the town of Bethany. He led them out as far as Bethany on the top of the Mount of Olives. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. This is what we do as pastors, right? We lift up our arms and we make the blessing at the end of the service. Um, it's just what Jesus did. Do we have to do that? No. Did Jesus have to do it? No, but he did, so we do. Um, why not? Um, he lifted up his hands, and he, he pronounced a blessing, and it's like, like the power went out from him. It's like the laying on of hands. We don't have to, but we lay the hands on someone, and we pray for them that the power of God might come in and bring them healing. We lay our hands on a young person getting confirmed that the power of God might fall on them. He lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And while he was, just what a thing uh, to, to bless someone. You can do that. You can go to your kids. You can go to your grandchildren. You can just lay your hand on their head and you can say, Jesus loves you and so do I. Or God bless you today and forever. You can come up with different blessings. You are a child of God and you will always be loved by him. You could speak these words of life and encouragement. Lord knows we hear enough garbage and enough put downs. But you could speak with a laying on of hands or with a blessing. God loves you. You are a child of God. You belong to him Read promises of scripture over a child. Um, he blessed them. And, and then while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven, the ascension. They watched him lifted up. It's the wonderful rose window at the front of our sanctuary. Jesus with his hands down because he's going up and now he's not blessing them up high anymore, but blessing them down. The, the Lord uh, blessed them as he was carried up into heaven. And their response was right at that moment, they worshiped him. As he was going up, they were going down on their knees and they were raising their hands to him and they were looking at him and they were worshiping him. I don't know if they could imagine just watching him. They'd seen him walking in the middle of the night on the, on the water. They could see Jesus doing many things, but here he's going up into the clouds, higher and higher, smaller and smaller, and they're worshiping him. They know he is the Lord God who has come to visit his people. And now he's promising in 10 days. Oh, they didn't know yet it was 10 days, but they'd find out that in 10 days, the spirit would come. And they, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Jesus left, but they weren't sad anymore. Something has changed. The, the resurrection and the blessing of Jesus has changed them from fearful and sad to joyful people. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. They went to the place of worship. I can't wait to invite all of you back. We hear the word tonight that the Ohio governor is, is uh, in three weeks going to be getting rid of we're of all the mandates. We may have some that we still do at the church. We may have some 
individuals who wish to wear masks, which would seem like if I was sneezing or coughing, I ought to wear a mask, right? But but um, we have to yet look what that will mean for good hope. But, oh, days of coming back together again. What a joy that will be. I see Kathy responded, that's exactly how I feel about coming home in less than a month. It took me so long to be patient back in 2019. Now I... I can't see it all. Now, uh, now I know it's for real. Well, Kathy, you'll have to give me a call and tell me about uh, your trip back home in, in less than a month. That would put you here uh, uh, around Father's Day, I think. Um, so uh, I don't know quite what your schedule is. I know dad's gone now, mom's closer to Rob, but um, God bless you. and. Uh, I hope we get to see you when you're back home. Well, um, the disciples went back to Jerusalem full of joy and, and praying and worshiping. And then Jesus is going to send the Spirit. We're going to hear more about that tomorrow night when we look at Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Tonight, let's just close with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the transformation that happens in the disciples when you open the word when you give them your peace, when you commission them to carry on your work in the world, for the world, and when you tell them to, to wait for the power of the Spirit that we will be clothed with. We'll be, it's like the investiture. Um, Lord, clothe us in your Holy Spirit. Give us our clean, new baptismal garments that we may be filled with hope, peace, and joy. Bless each person here this night. And in Jesus' name, amen. And so if Jesus is blessing them, let me bless you. God loves you, and so do I. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.